This is Lawrence Sherman from the Global Fertility Academy. Recently, in Lisbon, Portugal, during the 31st annual ESHRAE meeting, I sat down with some of the world's top thought leaders and discussed the challenges and opportunities faced in fertility today. Join me for this very exciting interview. Dr. Pasquale Patrizio, he's an MD, an MBE, and an HCLD, is a board-certified specialist in obstetrics and gynecology, reproductive endocrinology, and infertility and andrology. He's a professor of obstetrics and gynecology and medical director, Yale Fertility Center and Fertility Preservation Program. Dr. Patrizio has lectured throughout the world on topics of in vitro fertilization, male infertility, and ICSI and fertility preservation, garnering a number of awards. Dr. Patrizio is an associate editor for Journal of Assisted Reproduction and Genetics and a member of the editorial board of the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Fertility and Sterility, and Reproductive Biomedicine Online. He serves as a reviewer for many scientific journals, including Lancet, Human Reproduction, Fertility and Sterility, and is a reviewer for NIH grants. Dr. Patrizio has authored three books, one being the textbook Atlas, Assisted Reproductive Technologies, which has been translated also into Spanish and Chinese, and two e-books in assisted reproduction, in addition to 393 scientific papers, including 60 book chapters, 135 peer-reviewed publications, and 198 abstracts. He was the vice president of the International Society for Fertility Preservation from 2013 until 2014, vice president of the Special Interest Group in Regenerative Medicine for ASRM, and is a board member of the ISMAR. He, his current clinical interests include improving the efficiency of ART, reducing the risk of multiple pregnancy, fertility preservation strategies, and methods to simplify the clinical and laboratory aspects of IVF. Dr. Patrizio is also a, a member of the Global Fertility Academy Steering Committee. Pasquale, unfortunately, we've run out of time. <laughs> Too kind. Uh, it, well, it's a very impressive biography. It's very nice to see you, Pasquale. Thank you. So, let's get right into it. Pre-implantation genetic screening, or PGS, can provide substantial value for the woman or couple seeking a healthy live birth from IVF. The question is though, should all embryos undergo PGS, and if not, what criteria should be applied to select for the ones that should? Definitely every embryo that is produced in vitro, it's not corresponding to a live birth. So we know that the great majority of embryos, that they look normal, they are indeed not able to uh, implant once they are transferred. So definitely there is something that we need to do to improve the selection of which embryo should be transferred in order to improve the success rate uh, for every transfer that you do. And the PGS, pre-implantation genetic screening, is one of the methods that uh, seems to be able to help in identifying which embryo should be transferred. However, it requires a biopsy of the embryo. It's uh, one of the so-called methods of invasive uh, testing of the embryo. So you have to take a, a, a bunch of cells from an embryo that is day five old, and then uh, you have to freeze that embryo because you will not have enough time to re receive the results and then transfer that embryo in a fresh cycle. So th the PGS, as it is performed today, is done on day five embryos. You freeze the embryo, then you get the results, and then you decide which, if any, of the embryos that you biopsy are normal, but you need to do another cycle to replace the embryo. It's a very good method. There are also other methods that are now in the pipeline, which are so-called non-invasive methods. Uh, one of them is the time-lapse uh, uh, morphokinetics, so following an embryo during the various days of development. Um, and uh, those perhaps with the more data that is accumulating are going to be uh, perhaps even uh, integrating the PGS as a, an additional technology in a non-invasive way. That's really interesting. And then as a follow-up to the PGS, uh, carrier preconception screening remains a topic of discussion. Uh, what do you think about that? It's uh, also a very important question. Uh, uh, it would be great if we can find out before we uh, help a couple to reproduce if there is any specific uh, disease 
that should be avoided uh, in the embryo. And the, and the fact that there are many autosomic recessive conditions that uh, when, uh, when a person is a carrier is completely asymptomatic, so you have no way to know that there is a, a carrier of a particular disease in the couple unless you test them. And uh, therefore, if you can expand the carrier screening prior to in vitro fertilization, it will be a wonderful opportunity to be successful and in addition to be successful, avoiding the transmission of uh, genetic traits that are not compatible with life or with uh, a miscarriage or so forth. Okay, so, so you're really building up a bigger portfolio of screening that you do so that your results are better. Correct. So uh, there's also valid reasons for considering fresh embryo transfer as well as only frozen embryo transfer. What are your thoughts on this? The jury is still out on this particular topic. Uh, I, I think personally that uh, the, there are not enough data to, uh, to kind of uh, produce a, a switch in the way we are uh, uh, doing uh, in vitro fertilization cycles. I still think that there is uh, a lot of cycles that should be uh, combined with the fresh embryo transfer cycles. There are a few cases where I can see the, uh, the benefit on freezing all the embryos, but these are very few cases like ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, uh, which we are seeing less and less and less because we, we're getting very good at avoiding the syndrome in the first place. But in that case, it's good to, to freeze. There is a good opportunity to freeze when we do pre-implantation genetic screening because we don't have the time to receive the results. Fine, that's also good. Another opportunity will be in women that are perhaps poor responders so we have one embryo at a time, we can bank two or three cycles, so two or three embryos, and then we do one single transfer of two or three embryos to enhance the chance of pregnancy in that particular case. But out of these ones, I'm not convinced, as of today, that the frozen embryo transfer should be done in all cycles of uh, in vitro fertilization. So re re it requires some thought and, and really categorization. And, and you want to make sure that if you do it, you're doing it for the right reasons. Now, more and more women are postponing or considering postponing fertility through the use of elect elective oocyte banking. What are your thoughts on the, the banking? It is a, a fantastic opportunity. The technology on uh, oocyte freezing, egg freezing has now advanced to a point that uh, the results that have been obtained in, when those frozen eggs are utilized, especially for uh, donor eggs, for uh, are as good as fresh eggs in expertise and uh, great hands, of course, you need to have uh, a proper training for that. But this is very encouraging. Now, women that are in career, women that uh, have not yet been able to, uh, to find the, the right partner, or they are not uh, ready to, to start a family, they can uh, benefit of uh, all-side banking on elective reasons, because this is really a great opportunity to, to freeze in time the chance of a pregnancy. And I, I word it in this way, because I want to make sure that we don't give false illusions. We are not freezing a guarantee of a baby, but what we are freezing, we are freezing a chance of a future pregnancy corresponding to the age at which the eggs were frozen. Putting eggs in the liquid nitrogen does not rejuvenate the eggs, but it cryopreserves the chance of those eggs at the age in which those eggs were collected and, and harvested. But it's a terrific technology. But you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. Well, we are not putting everything on that, of course not. And uh, there are still some questions that need to be answered, like uh, how many eggs should we freeze? One cycle, two cycles, but it is a powerful technology. And, and improving opportunity. Absolutely. Let's move over to uh, ICSI, uh, which I think is an important technique in helping overcome male infertility. What are your thoughts on that as we see it today? Well, ICSI uh, now has been uh, around for uh, 23 years. It's a technology, again, extremely powerful in uh, 
uh, assuring fertilization in cases where the sperm count is extremely low or motility is extremely poor. But now, in the last five to 10 years, we've been seeing that the technology is not uh, up applied any longer to exclusive case of male infertility. Now, many laboratories around the world are using ICSI, which is the injection of a single sperm into an egg, in many more uh, cases which uh, go beyond the initial indications. So they are using when there are very few eggs, so in poor responder. They are using it when there is a severe endometriosis. They are using it when there is an unexplained infertility case, so they, without even trying for uh, conventional insemination. And uh, I can see that uh, uh, since we know that there are not increased risks of a uh, baby with the congenital malformations or genetic anomalies, or not to a point that should be a warning uh, message, that probably this technology is going to be uh, gaining more and more and more acceptance as we go by. And, and as we keep talking, the armamentarium that you have at your disposal continues to grow. And that's why it's exciting to be at ESHRAE right now. And as I look through the abstracts from, from ESHRAE this year, I see um, there's a lot of discussion around blastocyst transfer is better than three-day embryo transfer. What are your thoughts on this? I fully subscribe to this. Uh, um, I'm, uh, I'm extremely convinced that uh, by allowing the embryos to, go, to grow for five days instead of three, we allow, it, we allow them to go the natural selection. The laboratory procedures, the laboratory methodologies have got so good that there is no more worry or no, no more fear that by keeping the embryos in the lab, we humans are arresting their chance for growth. This is now no longer there. Therefore, if an embryo keeps growing to day five, and the great majority of embryos, unfortunately, they block, they arrest their growth between day three to day five, now you have a better chance to choose the right one. Now you have a better chance to reduce multiple pregnancy because you don't need to transfer so many embryos. And now you also have an opportunity, but this requires education of patients and colleagues, that you may also have cycles of in vitro fertilization where there is no embryo that was able to grow to day five. Therefore, in that particular cycle, with full honesty, we tell the patient, I'm sorry, this was not the cycle that was meant to be. And we will repeat another cycle. But to transfer an embryo on day three that would not have made it to day five, it's, uh, it's corresponding to a no pregnancy. Therefore, if you really want to increase your uh, success rate for transfer, you need to know which and if there is an embryo for transfer in that cycle. So you're optimizing that point. Completely, I'm optimizing and I'm a full support of the day five embryo transfer. Excellent. Is there anything else that you'd like to mention that's really hot and important coming out here at ESHRAE that you think people should hear about? Well, I think you touched upon uh, the most important uh, issues of, uh, of our profession and uh, we are really trying to minimize multiple pregnancy and blastocyst transfer is one way. Selecting the, the embryo for transfer and you, and you asked me about the PGS and that invasive, but you also asked me about the non-invasive and I talked to you about the time-lapse opportunity. You asked me about the elective oocyte banking, which is a very important topic. So you touched upon every single one of the hot uh, topics in our field. Then we must be finished. It's always good to Thank talk you. to you, Pasquale. Thank you very much.